Hello and welcome back to Guillotine, the 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to hang out with some of my favorite families, and that's the families of the periodic table. The noble gases and the alkali metals are a great place to start. And so what we'll do is talk a little bit about the characteristics and behaviors of both of those families. And the way we're going to approach this for, the, for all the families that we're going to talk about is we'll start by talking about some of the general properties of the family, and then we'll pick out a couple of elements to highlight. Not necessarily the uh, most famous elements of the family, but some elements that demonstrate some of the properties, both structural and behavioral, that are common to that family. So we'll start with the noble gases, great place to start. Most of the uh, noble gases were discovered by a guy named William Ramsey. Uh, they are inert. That means they're unreactive. You, you can force the uh, big ones into uh, compounds in the laboratory, but uh, it's unnatural. You don't see that happen in nature. Sort of like you won't see a dog climb into a sweater uh, in nature. You know, that, that, that dog's been forced into a sweater. Uh, please do not send me YouTube videos of dogs climbing into sweaters by their own accord. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Sir, Sir William Ramsey discovered most of the uh, noble gases. He had a technique of cooling the gases down and then using diffraction uh, to separate the gases out. And he got very good at it. Uh, crushed most of the gases by himself. And for this, he was awarded one of the first Nobel Prizes. Remember, there's a difference between the Nobel Prize and the noble gas. So don't confuse the two terms. Uh, Alfred Nobel does make an appearance on the periodic table with no nobilium. Um, uh, down in the lanthanides, but again, that family's named the noble gases. They start with completely full valence shells, mostly eight with the exception of helium, which is two, for structural reasons we'll get into later in the year. Uh, but that makes them unreactive because they already have that full outer shell. So the properties of no gases, as we did state, again, are going to be extremely stable. They're not going to be highly reactive at all. And uh, that makes it a desirable state to be. So other gases and solids and liquids, to, to, to that matter, will react chemically to gain or lose electrons to get the same number as a noble gas. Remember that gaining or losing electrons will not create a new element because the number of protons do not change. So again, to steal my own thunder a little bit, the, the group to the left of the noble gases are the halogens. Now the halogens all have seven electrons, the, the, the noble gases have eight. And so the halogens will want to gain one more electron to become isoelectric with the noble gas. They don't become a noble gas, but for the sake of electron configuration, they look like it. And the same would go for the alkali metals on the other side of the periodic table. They're the first group. They have one valence electron, and so by losing a valence electron, they will become isoelectric with the noble gas. Uh, and, and again, as I, as I pointed out last time, and I'll continue to point out, tie this into those most likely charges that you're going to see. You know, what's the most likely charge of a halogen? What's the most likely charge of an alkali metal? But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Everybody loves helium. Uh, the reason it makes your voice higher is because it's a less dense medium in your throat. So that it causes your vocal cords to, to uh, vibrate at a higher pitch. It's non-flammable since it's a noble gas. Great for things that you want to float, like weather balloons or a balloon boy from a couple years back. <laughs> um, again, he would have needed a lot more balloons to get aloft, but that's what happens when newscasters don't call chemists before reporting on stories. Uh, but again, we also up, so I can understand how you might make that misunderstanding. By the way, uh, you might have an aunt or an uncle who says, don't, don't inhale helium uh, because uh, it's going to damage your brain. Well, it's not, it doesn't react with anything. The helium's not damaging your brain, but if you're not inhaling oxygen, that, that could cause problems. Uh, interesting enough also, there's starting to become a helium shortage, uh, so you might want to look that up. Yeah, the days of, of walking around the helium balloon might be uh, uh, numbered for the 99%. Uh, neon and argon are uh, also noble gases. Uh, they are used a lot in advertising to give certain colors. By exciting the atoms, they give off the characteristic light. The neon sign, though, is, true, uh, is a true red color. If it's not red, then it's not technically a neon sign. Radon's an interesting noble gas because uh, you would wonder why a inert gas would be dangerous. Uh, that's because radon has a big nucleus, an unstable nucleus, and so what will happen is it will go un under undergo radioactive decay, and it will lose part of the nucleus and actually become a different element, and that element it becomes is polonium, 
And so if you're inhaling radon gas, it's not a problem, but it will decay into polonium. And if you have polonium in your lungs, that's a big problem. So especially in Western Pennsylvania, you, you definitely want to have your house checked for radon. It's going to gather in the basements because it's coming up from the underlying rocks. It's a pretty easy problem to take care of, I guess. You, you just have to remediate the air, you know, make sure that it's not collecting in the basement. So really not that big of a deal as long as you're acknowledging that you have it and then getting it out of those low-lying areas. Radon. So if we jump around to the other side of the periodic table, we'll run into the alkali metals. Now the alkali metals have only one valence electron in their outer shell. And as you may imagine then, that's going to make them pretty reactive because losing that electron is going to make them isoelectric with a noble gas. Again, they don't become the noble gas, but by losing one, they become isoelectric with a noble gas. Um, if, if, if you uh, run into me on the street, I'll tell you about my uh, first children's story, in fact. Yeah. That I haven't written yet, but it'll be about uh, Sally Sodium and her quest to fit in with the noble gases. So the idea of losing electron is very favorable. So these tend to be extremely reactive because they want to get rid of that valence electron to have that full outer shell underneath. And the reactivity will increase going down a family, and I will once again repeat my pat phrase, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later uh, when we get into modern atomic structure. But as you go down, you're going to get see more and more exciting reactions. Now, as, as a first-year chemistry student, you're not really going to get the opportunity to handle these metals. They're a little dangerous for laboratory conditions, but they're great for demos. And uh, you're only a click away from watching copious amounts of demonstrations on the Internet of these. They are soft metals. Imagine sort of a metallic Tootsie Roll. You can cut them with a knife. Uh, they, they will uh, look shiny once you cut them, but they will quickly react with the oxygen in the air and uh, uh, become dull in color, hence oxidation. You have to store them under oil and kerosene because they will also react with water violently to, again, achieve that full valence shell. In fact, remind me again of, uh, of my story about cleaning up some old sodium I found in the laboratory. In fact, any chemist you run into probably has a sodium war story to share with you. It's sort of a, a rite of passage, I guess. Uh, maybe less so with the modern chemists than, than some of the more old school chemists out there, but they probably still have a, a sodium story under their belt. Uh, when, when you put them in water, they, they end up forming uh, polyatomics called hydroxides, which ends up driving the pH uh, way up. And that's why they're, they're known as alkali or alkaline solutions. Uh, so that's where that comes from. And we'll talk about it again when we get to the alkaline earth metals right next door. So a few of the alkali metals. Lithium, uh, the lightest metal. I guess that could be my second children's book there. That sounds like a great title for a children's book. A lot, a lot of times you'll see this in experimental batteries or uh, just regular batteries like lithium, lithium ion batteries. And it, it, it's definitely in the past been used to treat depression and other types of mood disorders. And it sounds like it still is one of the tools in the, in the psychiatrist's bag, uh, but not the only tool available now. Sodium, famous for its starring role in table salt, sodium chloride. And also in uh, those yellow street lights you see that you wouldn't want to read a book under, but are very bright. And the reason they use sodium and sodium vapors in street lights is it's a very efficient light. It doesn't take a lot of energy to get that bright light. In fact, right outside the school I teach with, teach at, uh, there is uh, some sodium lights up on the wall. So they make a great cheap source of light for outside. Francium, we'll skip ahead again, but if you if you continue down, really great demos that you can see for a lot of those. Francium would be the best demo of all. It would be the most reactive of them all, but due to the fact that it's uh, extremely rare, we'll never get to see a francium demo, unfortunately. Uh, it only exists as sort of like a rest stop as other, other elements undergo radioactive decay. So you'll never probably get to see francium in water, which is a bit of a bummer, but, you know, we'll, we'll manage. So anyway, I hope that you're, you're going to take the time and connect what we talked about today to those, again, most likely charges of ions. Again, the noble gases, since they already have a full outer shell, you're looking at a zero charge. While the alkaline metals, having one valence electron, when they lose that, that will give them an unbalanced positive charge, which will give them a plus one charge. Now, however you want to do that, draw it, pantomime it, make a puppet show, whatever you do, but you want to really start connecting the families of the periodic table with their most likely charge. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope you're checking out the links at the bottom. No matter what, keep learning that chemistry and have a great day.